You recently watched a lecture on the history of China from 1911 to 1949. This was a nice comprehensive view of the time period. Today, I'm going to zoom into some of what they discussed and then continue on until about the 1990s. First, communism in China begins in three separate movements. There's the intellectual movement where the Dean of the University of Beijing officially founds the party in 1921. Second, there were worker movements in factories in China's largest cities like Shanghai. And third, there were peasant movements in many rural areas. By the way, most of China is rural once you get away from the coast. Peasants began organizing collectives on their own and started rebelling against the landowning class. You learned of Chang's extermination campaigns in the last video in which he was effective in rooting out communism in the cities and by assassinating the intellectuals. The peasant movements continued to grow as they remained out of the, his reach. This became particularly true following the Shanghai massacre in 1927. How does Mao fit into all of this and how does he become the leader of the CCP or Chinese Communist Party? To understand Chinese communism, it is important to understand Mao. He was born in Henan province in a rural village. His parents sent him to a boarding school at a young age and hoped that educating their son would allow him to obtain a much coveted civil service job. This was one of the few ways people could achieve upward mobility in China. He was bullied as a child. The other students didn't like that he was poor, rural, and quote, different. But he persevered, went to the University of Beijing around the same time the CCP was formed. But he wasn't political while he was there. He was still trying to be a dutiful son. He sits for his exams for the civil service, um, and unfortunately, he fails them. So not wanting to return to his home village uh, as a failure and a shame to his parents, he stays on and he decides to go to Shanghai to get work in factories. There he would have been exposed to the communist movement uh, in the factories, but he wasn't really active in it at that time either. He eventually goes home to Henan, um, which means that he is not in Shanghai in 1927 uh, during the Shanghai Massacre. There he gets involved with the Chinese Communist Party and leads the peasant movements. As the last video pointed out, it was during the Long March where he fights the Kuomintang by day flees by night that he becomes the leader of the Chinese Communist Party. He was extremely charismatic and took on a cult-like following. When they eventually reached safety in the caves of Yunnan, <clears throat> he hones his leadership skills and he owns in his own brand of communism. The Long March becomes the exodus story of the mythology of the Chinese Communist Party. Mao's brand of communism places heavy emphasis on the masses, and he believes that you have to change people's minds before you can change them and have them change the government. You have to convert them to be selfless versus being selfish. He would tell parables or stories with moral implications, much like Jesus and others did. The most common parable from the Anon period that will be retold many times is the foolish old man who removed the mountains which you looked at this week in your participation assignment. After a short truce during the Pacific War between 1937 and 1945, when the CCP and the KMT stopped fighting each other and fought the Japanese, they again picked up arms against each other once the US defeated Japan. With Mao and the CP, CP victorious and Chiang and his forces fleeing to Taiwan, Mao moves into the imperial palace and claims the mandate of heaven. The Chinese political system was a dual system, much like that of the Soviet Union. Zhao Enlai became the premier or the head of the government, while Mao remained in control of the party and the military. They massacred landowners and took control of the land. They engaged in massive mobilization campaigns to change people's thoughts. Mao enacted five-year plans, much like Stalin's in the Soviet Union, and was always fearful of enemies, real or imagined. With the U.S. in Japan and Korea, and Chiang hoping to reinvade the mainland, Mao worried for his safety. 
He also worried that industrialization was too slow under the five-year plan and instituted the Great Leap Forward to hasten production. Stop the lecture video and go to the PowerPoint to view this short video on the Great Leap Forward. Following this disaster, when approximately 20 to 30 million Chinese people die, Mao is forced to disengage from politics for a time. Reformers like Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shikui roll back some of Mao's harsher policies. Dissatisfied with being sidelined, Mao grooms another group of followers known as the Red Guard and institutes the Cultural Revolution to take back control. It is around this time that Mao publishes the quotations of Chairman Mao, mostly in pocket-sized versions. These little red books would be carried at all times and members of the Red Guard could quote Mao the way an evangelical Christian might quote Bible passages. Another 34,000 Chinese people die during the Cultural Revolution. Lin Baiyao, the chief ex executor of the Cultural Revolution, grows skeptical of all the blood on his hands. When he voices his concerns to Mao, shockingly, Mao gives him the okay to leave. Lin arranges a flight to the Soviet Union. Mao stages a rally in which he accuses Lin of being a traitor. Then as Lin's plane appears over the rally, Mao stretches out his arm in the direction of the plane and it blows up in midair. Not long after, the revolution ends. Communist China and the Soviet Union were allies during Stalin's reign and for a brief time when Khrushchev was in power. In fact, the Soviet Union was helping China develop nuclear weapons. But after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which coincided with the Great Leap Forward, Khrushchev cut off nuclear aid to China, fearing that Mao might actually use nuclear weapons. As discussed in the Cold War Lecture 2, this deterioration of relations was known as the Sino-Soviet split. When Brezhnev succeeded Khrushchev in 1964, he issued the Brezhnev Doctrine. It said that the Soviet Union were the leaders of the communist world, and as such, they had a right to intervene wherever communism was being threatened. It was not so subtly warning China to stay out of European affairs. In 1971, as depicted in the movie Forrest Gump, the U.S. and China had a ping pong match and other small gestures started the Nixon administration to open relations with Red China. When Mao dies in 1976, he is given a funeral with full honor similar to that of the emperors. However, in order to have closure, the new government tries Mao's wife and three of his closest advisors, known as the Gang of Four, for the many crimes of Mao. They are sentenced to execution. Deng Xiaoping came to power not long after. He changed China's economy to a mixed economy with elements of both capitalism and communism. What does it matter if a cat is black or white, whether it's communist or capitalist, as long as it catches mice, as long as it makes money? The U.S. recognizes his government as the legitimate government of China, and the U.N. Security Council seat is given to mainland China and taken away from Taiwan. Make no mistake, Deng was a pragmatist when it came to the economy, but politically he was just as devout as Mao. When in 1989, student demonstrators saw an opportunity to use nonviolent protests to demand more political freedom, he ordered the protesters be dispersed by any means necessary. As many as several thousand protesters were killed and 10,000 were arrested. Subsequent Chinese presidents have censored the event. In recent times, we have witnessed protests in many places in China and the refusal of the government to change. In conclusion, China continues to be a frenemy to the United States. Its, econo its economic growth has been incredible in the 21st century, but its political growth remains stagnant.